All right. It's 11 o'clock, so we are going to get going. So welcome, everybody. I hope everybody had a good Easter holiday, well, holiday break, long weekend, however you choose to celebrate it. I hope you all had a, a restful time and, um, yeah, looking forward to getting back into it. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before I get going. Um, I am recording today's session. Uh, so if you'd like a copy of the slides or recording, they will both be available after the webinar. Um, I am also working from home, but hopefully you can't hear too much background noise, but apologies if anything is unclear, just let me know, uh, like say, if, if there's any technical issues or sound issues, uh, do let us know. Um, there will be a quick survey at the launching at the very end of this webinar. We always appreciate all of the feedback that you give us. It's how we can make these presentations better over time. So hopefully you can take a few seconds to fill that in. Uh, and finally, um, just as a little reminder, we do have a uh, little kind of contest, contest, a prize draw actually at the end of each month. Um, if you attend these webinars in full, uh, your name will automatically get put into a prize draw to win some Apple goodies. Um, so if you need any more details on that, do let us know and we'll send that on over to you. But yeah, let's get going. So today we're of course gonna be talking about coastal erosion and I guess a good place to start is what it actually is. It's not a new phenomenon in the country. It has happened for a very, very long time and it will continue to do so. But it's really only very recently that we have been successful in being able to predict the areas uh, of the country most at risk from coastal erosion and judge how quickly uh, that will actually happen, how that's going to occur. Um, you know, to break it down, there's various kind of factors that happen during coastal erosion um, and that basically increase its occurrence. One of the biggest factors is waves and they really the strength of the waves breaking along the coastline. We've got longer fetches and, lo and stronger winds, which create bigger, more powerful waves that have a more erosive power. And this exerts an exceptional amount of pressure on the surrounding rock and can progressively remove pieces. So this is also known as hydraulic action. Um, in addition to that, you have, of course, debris. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it is, is both uh, man-made and, and natural um, objects can be transported by waves and also cause coastal erosion. Objects transported can break down, damage cliffs through waves and storms, and this is actually what you call abrasion. Now, abrasion occurs as breaking waves concentrated between the high and low water marks, which contain sand and large fragments wear away at the base of a cliff or a headland. Um, and this is this little kind of little, this little effect is commonly known as the sandpaper effect. And this process is particularly common in high energy storm conditions. Um, you've also got something called corrosion. Now corrosion occurs when the sea's pH so anything below seven corrodes rocks, rocks on a cliff face. So this is also known as chemical weathering. Now, what can cause the water's pH to change? Well, a whole bunch of different factors. Carbon dioxide, which is of course naturally in the atmosphere, dissolves into seawater. Uh, water and carbon dioxide combine to form a carbonic acid, uh, which is a weak acid that breaks into hydrogen ions and by carbon ions. And because of, of course, human driven increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there's more CO2 dissolving into the ocean. And the ocean's average pH is now 8.1, which is basic or alkaline. But as the ocean continues to absorb most, more CO2, the pH decreases and the ocean becomes more acidic. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a whole bunch of different factors and, and you know, climate change is definitely one of those factors. Um, and another big factor in terms of how easily the coastline erodes is, of course, geology. So you've got different kinds of rock types and rock faces. You've got soft rocks. Um, things like limestone and chalk uh, are definitely more susceptible to corrosion and erosion. 
So a coastline made of chalk, like the ones you see kind of where Groucher is based in Sussex or uh, down in Dorset, um, will change relatively quickly in comparison to other areas of hard rock, uh, let's say like Land's End, which is made up of igneous rock, which are a lot more resistant to things like weathering and erosion. So a coastline made of granite like Land's End will change much more slowly than a place like, um, you know, East Sussex, uh, where there's a lot of chalk. And as you can see there, you know, nice white cliffs, beautiful to look at, not so great when it comes to um, coastal erosion. Now, in terms of climate change, there has been a lot in the news about climate change. There have been scientists gluing their hands. I don't know if you've seen this recently. There have been scientists gluing their hands, um, you know, to buildings and protest. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm being kind of scaremongering, but it is a pretty serious, uh, you know, occurrence. It's it's the IPCC. A report isn't hasn't been great news. Um, it's all been in you know in the news in the media recently, and really rising global temperatures are leading to global sea level rises by the by causing the melting of glaciers and the land-based ice sheets in polar regions, as well as thermal expansion of ocean water. So since really the, the early 90s, global sea levels have been monitored by satellites, which show that it's currently rising at an average of 3.3 millimeters per year. That's an acceleration from the rate of 1.4 millimeters per year, which was the average calculated for the 20th century. Um, you've got things like ocean temperature, thermodynamic expansion, the warming of Earth is primarily due to the accumulation of heat trapping greenhouse gases, and more than 90% of this trapped heat is absorbed by the oceans. So everything that I've talked about earlier, the, acid the acidification, it reduces the amount of mollusks as shells don't form so well, which in turn reduces beach nourish nourishment and can expose coasts. And this is again linked back to the corrosion and how the, the ocean's pH is changing due to the uptake of carbon dioxide. Um, you know, the, the, the mean sea level is going to rise um, above its standard ranges or above what people are predicting um, by 2100. So all of these have a, uh, you know, it's, it's not great news, not just for coastal erosion, but in general. Um, but this is definitely a factor that is impacting our coasts. Now, the total rise in sea levels off the UK coast may exceed one meter and could potentially reach two meters. The frequency of intense storm events is expected to increase and along with a rise in sea level to lead, more, uh, to lead to more coastal flooding. Temperatures are expected to rise, particularly in the south and the east of the country, and winter precipitation is likely to increase by quite a lot on the northern and western UK coastline. Now, coastal erosion is also expected to increase, uh, partly due to the sea level rise. Um, Low-lying and soft sediment coasts will be the most vulnerable, so it, an example, the east of England, and we are going to look at different examples all across the country um, because they are more easily eroded. Now, the UK vulnerability is indicated by the fact that it has around 2,300 kilometers of artificially protected coast. That's some of the longest in Europe. Um, annual damages due to coastal erosion are expected to increase um, by three to nine times, costing up to 126 million per year by the 2080s. So some big numbers there, um, specifically for the UK, but we've got a lot of coastline. And so it's something that needs to be looked at. Uh, otherwise there could be some serious implications for people who do live uh, along the coast. Um, and we're not just talking about people's houses, but we're looking at farmland, you know, major infrastructure, train, way, uh, train lines, uh, railway lines, they're all at risk. And so it's definitely something that it's, is being excavated as the years have gone on. And as, as you've all seen, we've had increasing storms, increasing inclement weather, uh, you know, freak weather events, all sorts. And so this is just going to uh, happen quite a lot more. 
Now, according to the Office of National Statistics, there are currently 169 coastal towns across the UK. And we're going to take a look at some examples uh, in this section where coastal erosion is definitely a factor and impacting uh, these, these areas. So I'm going to start off with the Berlin Gap, which is actually closer to me. Um, down here in Brighton. So the chalk cliffs of the Seven Sisters are crumbling at a rate of about 60 centimeters per year on average. Uh, at, at Berlin Gap, which is what you're looking at in this photo, the, ero the rate of erosion is actually a lot faster. Uh, when a cliff fall occurs, it's known as an active period, when falls are likely and very unpredictable. This leaves a French, fresh, dense chalk cliff face uh, protected by thousands of tons of chalk boulders at the bottom. So these boulders, unfortunately, act as a breakwater, protecting the dense chalk uh, rock cliff against the tide. So this is a passive period. Now, when the tide turns and recedes, you're gonna see the sea's gonna be white, which makes sense. This is the chalk that's being dissolved by the sea. Remarkably, this happens very, very quickly with two tides per day, which is why the boulders will reduce and the protection of the ba at the base of the cliffs will no longer you know, be in place to protect them. And over time, you get cracks that form with chalk cliffs, and they will be constantly kind of lashed by not just uh, wind, but also by rain and the waves. And that also adds to kind of the speeding up of coastal erosion, because that drives the moisture further into the cliff face. And over the, the winter, the water in the cracks freeze, and then it expands enlarging the cracks even more, and then eventually turning them into fissures. And those fissures then weaken the cliff even further, and inevitably there'll be another cliff fall. And the cycle re repeats itself over and over and over again. So it's a lot of factors that are impacting our coasts. It's not just waves breaking, it's, it's, it's really everything. And it's all interlinked and tied together. Um, moving on to different part of the country. So this is Skipsey. This is a village located six miles north of Hornsey. Um, it lies on soft boulder clay and experiences the highest rate of erosion uh, in Europe, or one of the highest rates of erosion in Europe. A combination of things like stormy weather and rising sea levels have caused more than 10 meters of the cliff to disappear from a two mile stretch of the coast. Um, in just nine months back in 2020, compared with the annual average of four meters. Uh, in just six months, three strips of coastline lost uh, nearly double what they were expected to lose in a year. So that's a pretty significant um, rate. Until recently, 19 properties sat uh, adjacent to the coast along Green Lane. Now there's only 16. And it has been suggested that the remaining residents will need to vacate their properties within a couple of years. However, a single erosion event could put the properties at imminent risk within the next year. So if something significant happens storm-wise, that, that kind of time frame could definitely be pushed forward. So not a great um, place to be, if I'm being perfectly honest. You've also got Witham Sea, which is also has a fair amount of coastal erosion. It's only down the coast from the previous slide. So, you know, I think everybody has this dream of having a house by the coast, but the prospect of a home falling into the sea, of course, is, is pretty nightmarish. And in some parts of the country, it's much more prevalent uh, than others. So particularly on the shores of the North Sea, uh, not far from the Spurn National Nature Reserve, which is this area, the effects of coastal erosion can definitely be seen. So both Farmers Fields and the Golden Sands Holiday Park uh, near Withern Sea are affected. So that's in the HU19 postcode. Um, based on these figures, more sections of holiday parks could fall into the sea. Uh, if residents' homes are washed away, current estimates Estimates show that the average cost of a rebuild is about 184,000. So it can be a pretty significant amount of money uh, if you are that, if you are going to be impacted by this type of uh, coastal erosion. Now, the average property price in that area is roughly about 124,000 uh, for the 3,338 houses there, and the average home insurance premium is 114 pounds and 89 pence. So again. This all impacts, you know, people's average home uh, properties. It can it, it can impact insurance, and it's one to to just think about if you do have any clients that are looking for a dream home by the sea. 
um, just some factors to think about. Um, in this particular area, this is the Norfolk coast, and it's quite infamous for being one of the fastest eroding coastlines in the country as well, because of a mix of soft clay and the battering waves of the North Sea. Now, along the coast, a number of villages have been abandoned or lost due to the power of the sea. And local records suggest that village, the villages of Clare and uh, Falness succumbed to erosion in the 15th century, while other villages lost include places like Ness, uh, Keswick, Newton, Shipton, and Waxham Parva. And if there's anybody from that area that is listening in, and I have mispronounced those village names, I'm very sorry. Um, where else? Wales, we can't really forget about Wales. Uh, coastal erosion was brought into sharp focus in Wales when a major uh, 40 meter landslide fell uh, onto Neffin Beach in Gwynedd in April, 2021. And the slip saw parts of people's back gardens sliding onto the beach below. Um, and one of the locals, of course, has described it as shocking and awful for those affected. It's pretty significant. And I'm gonna show you a couple of um, closer photos of the actual landslide itself. Um, so yeah, you've got, that's pretty close to people's back gardens. It is part of people's back gardens. Um, and you know they've had to cordon off people's back gardens because of the damage. So significant, significant um, amount of coastal erosion happening. Now this uh, particular area, that's in Fairborn in North Wales. So it's expected that 157 miles of the Welsh co coastline will be at risk of coastal erosion. Uh, that's 18%. Now advisors have warned that 2,126 properties in Wales are in danger of sea erosion and around 36,000 are at risk of coastal flooding by the end of the century if coastal defenses are not maintained. Now industry experts have warned people may find it harder to get a mortgage or insurance in some of these affected areas. And of course, this doesn't just apply to Wales. This situation could lead to higher insurance premiums and banks demanding much more than a normal deposit, uh, roughly about 30% upwards for a mortgage in areas where property is susceptible to attack from the sea. Now the flood and coastal erosion risk management program will see 17 million pounds given to natural resources of Wales. More than 7 million will cover core flood activities, including things like maintenance and mapping projects, and 19 million pounds are going to local authorities. And really, this, is, this isn't just happening, well, this is happening in all parts of the country. You know, difficult decisions are being made where communities are facing rising sea levels and increased storminess which of course comes and is tied to the warming climate. Um, you know, this particular area is a really good example of this because it sits on a low lying sandbar behind coastal and estuarine defenses, which will become increasingly more difficult to manage. Now the defenses have been earmarked for managed realignment in the shore shoreline management plan, as this is considered the most sustainable solution to, to keep residents safe in the long term. Fairborn received a fair amount of media attention. However, it's not just confined to this village. As I mentioned earlier, there's all sorts of communities that are going to have to make these types of decisions and face these difficult decisions over the next century. Now in Wales, 95 coastal areas will move from a holding the line policy, which is a defending policy, to a no active intervention or managed realignment policy by 2100. And around 40 of those areas may require relocation of property. Now, does a policy of managed realignment mean that there's complete withdrawal of support? No, um, but it's probably not the greatest, uh, in my personal opinion. Uh, the Welsh government continue to provide funding for defences, maintenance and adaptation studies in Fairborn. And since 2013, eight million pounds has been invested to keep its residents safe, to plan ahead to adapt. And ongoing research is also helping, you know, us and the wider community to understand the impacts of how similar communities can be supported through this change and through that adaptation process. So just something to think about, again, if you've got clients that are looking at buying their dream home, um, you know, in these kind of beautiful coastal towns, it is something to, to make sure that they're aware of. Um, what other parts of the country are we looking at? Let's have a look at Lincolnshire. So, 
up until the 13th century, the coast of Lincolnshire is thought to have been protected by a series of offshore coastal barrier islands. However, the, the offshore islands were finally destroyed by an unprecedented series of storms and floods in the 12th century. Now, as this area uh, of the Lincolnshire coastline was previously sheltered, it was then left vulnerable to the full force of storms and tides of the North Sea where, when the islands disappeared. So the coastlines consequently saw a very significant degree of flooding and erosion, resulting in the loss of a number of settlements, churches, and a strip of coastal land perhaps a mile or more wide by the end of the 16th century. Um, you've got uh, two hamlets within Skegness, Skegness Parish called East and West Meals. Um, they were taken by the sea in the early 16th century and Sutton and the Marsh suffered a parallel fate in the middle of that century as well. And it was confirmed in about 1953, 1954 when a number of building sites um, were revealed at low water after the sand of the modern beach was actually washed away by storms. And so, you know, you get things like strange remains. So this is the remains of prehistoric forest, which can be seen at a very low tide tree stump uh, on Cleethorpe's beach at forests, Cleethorpe's, Cleethorpe's beach, beach in Lincolnshire. And then you've also got uh, the view over Mablethorpe beach uh, from the modern Gulf Road, Quebec Road car park and the settlement and church of Mablethorpe St. Peter is said to lay offshore from this spot. So people kind of discover that things used to be a lot further out and the vulnerability of the coast has been dramatically demonstrated by both the extensive flooding up to 10 kilometers inland uh, seen in 1953 and the subsequent construction of a 19 kilometer long concrete sea wall to try to defend against similar, uh, similar events in the future. So, you know, our coastline has changed dramatically uh, over a very long period of time, but it seems that it could potentially be speeding up uh, at a much, much faster rate. So yeah, just some interesting bits. I hope I've kind of given you a, a good flavor of the different parts of the country and how they're being affected. But as you can see, it's not concentrated in one area. It is really all over the place. And again, just remember different factors uh, really do contribute to the speed, the wind, the waves, what the, the rocks are made out of, what the coast is made out of, et cetera, et cetera. All that really does matter and contribute. Now, it would be silly not to talk about coastal defenses because they are a big part of, of coastal erosion. Um, you've got different kinds of coastal defenses. We've put some examples up on the screen for you to have a look at. You've probably seen one form or another um, if you've been to different parts of the country, things like rock armor, we've got a lot of groins, certainly down in Brighton, Hove and Worthing, where, where I am. Um, these are the wood structures built out at right angles into the sea. Um, sea walls, beach nourishment, beach reprofiling. Re um, sometimes you'll see the big diggers out there looking like they're just shuffling a bunch of sand and rocks around, but actually that's beach reprofiling. So all of these coastal defenses are implemented in different parts of the country and they are maintained. Um, and so it's just worth, you know, keeping an eye out on those. And if there's any shoreline management plans, then we, you know, it's worth knowing about those as well, depending on the area that you're in. Um, so like last year, a major annual scheme to replenish Lincolnshire's beaches got underway. The Environment Agency's 7 million beach management scheme uh, sees sand dredged from the seabed and pumped onto the beach to replace levels lost during the winter. And replenishing the sand means the beaches, instead of hard, defense like, hard defenses like seawalls, take the brunt of the waves and the forces and the energies that come with that. And this reduces the amount of damage and coastal erosion to the hard defenses which are put in, which help protect you know, up to 20,000 homes in this particular case, uh, and businesses that are numbering in about 24,500, as well as you know, static caravans. So just to give you an idea of how much um, sand, more than 400,000 cubic meters of sand was pumped back onto the beach uh, in, in this part of the country. I don't even know how to actually give you a good visual of that 400,000 cubic meters. It's a significant amount. 
um, but it just gives you an idea of the amount of work that actually goes into these types of defenses. Um, let's take a quick look at uh, a shoreline management plan. So uh, Kelling to Low Stop, low stop Nest, Nest has a shoreline management plan in place. So this follows the east coast. It's the most easterly point of the UK. And the site in the photo is overlooking the North Sea and has a direction marker known as the Euroscope, marking locations in other countries and their distance from Nest Point. Now, some actions within the SMP will be site specific. However, others might more, might more effectively and be more broadly used. So some actions might only involve one operating authority. Others may benefit from collaboration between coastal authorities. In some cases, the required actions will comprise the delivery of tried and tested solutions. Others will involve the development of new measures. Now, the effectiveness of many of these actions will depend on the proper engagement and involvement of wider uh, groups and stakeholders. And so really, there's various scenarios for managing um, coastal action or coastal erosion. So you've got no active interve intervention. Um, so this means that no new defenses are going to be um, are going to be constructed or maintained. Um, they're not even going to maintain existing def defenses if present. Um, so that's the no active intervention kind of scenario. Then you've got a hold the line, which means current defenses are going to be maintained. And then you've got something called managed realignment. And this involves allowing the shoreline to move to an agreed position and may involve some controlled erosion and loss of land. And then you've got advance the line. This involves new defenses planned to extend the land area out to sea. Now, unsurprisingly, this is a very rare activity. And at present, it's planned in only one small area of ethics for a few hundred meters. So more than likely what you're going to see and you will see if you ever look at the coastal erosion section uh, in our reports is you'll see the kind of scenarios for coastal erosion, but you'll tend to see no active intervention holding the line or a managed realignment as opposed to something like advanced line because it's very, very rare. Um, what else? Let's just have a quick look at some other parts of the country in terms of uh, defenses. So Cardiff was named one of the world's most at-risk cities from global warming. Uh, the Tremorpha and Peng Pengham Green areas of Cardiff are at significant risk of flooding from the sea and the river. Now, much of the coastline in this area is eroding uh, and flood risk will increase in future due to the rising sea levels caused by climate change. So there's a whole bunch of projects that are being put in. As you can see, the area outlined in red, um, and, and we've put kind of some of the, the defenses that they are considering and looking at uh, for this area. And again, this is going to be happening in different parts of the country. Um, in this particular example, the project will involve a construction of a series of pluvial and coastal flood defenses, including things like rock armor, uh, concrete erosion protection mats, earth buns, floodgates, et cetera, et cetera. And the project is hoping to reduce the risk of failing coastal flood defenses and the release of contaminated landfill material into the Severn estuary. So that's another kind of unfortunate thing that happens when coastal erosion and flooding uh, happen in specific areas. You have the risk of contamination moving around. Um, it will reduce and manage the flood risk to this area to approximately 2,656 resident, residential properties and approximately 294 commercial properties over the same period. So works are, like, are likely to begin in February this year, or they've started already in February this year, and they're hoping to be done by October 2023. Um, and again, these types of projects are cropping up all over the country. and Another thing that's being taken into consideration when you're looking at coastal erosion will be things like uh, flood maps for planning and coastal erosion maps for planning, uh, because, of course, we need to take that into consideration when we are looking at building uh, more within uh, different parts of the country. So, again, something just to take into consideration, particularly if you are in a coastal area.
Now, let's take a look at data and also how the risk is presented. So, as an example, there have been reports very recently of a large crack appearing close to the cliff path of Seaford Head in Sussex, approximately 15 to 20 meters from the cliff edge. And since it was first identified, that crack has already grown. And with the recent rain and freezing weather, a collapse looks highly possible. Okay, so you can see that giant crack in the photo on the left hand side. Now, what does that actually look like? So the environment agency data suggests that this kind of scenario would only occur in the medium term, which is 20 to 50 years, but with a low probability of 5%. Environment agency predictions are based on average rates of erosion, but catastrophic collapses can always happen on unstable cliff tops. So we exercise caution in the use of data and recognize that significant events such as this can accelerate erosion risks significantly. So for this reason, ground shore presents all possible future coastal erosion scenarios within our reports to help people prepare for the worst. So when you are choosing your search to make sure that you pick one that does include all available data and not only one that might be, you know, that'll show you information that might be relevant just in the short term. So for us, we really do think that showing you short term, medium term and long term is really important because if something significant does happen, because if there's a freak storm and something significant happens along the coast, the coastal areas, then something that would have been medium term could actually be brought forward to long term, uh, to short term, sorry. And that's why it's really important, because the importance of using things like um, it, this also impacts things like developing and implementing engineering solutions, things like modifying planning policies. We want to make sure that you, you are aware of what the potential is and, and you know, in the worst case scenario. Um, we, util we utilize and visualize the latest national coastal erosion risk mapping. Say that 10 times. National Coastal Erosion Risk Mapping, or NCERM, from the Environment Agency and Natural Resources Wales to show exactly which areas are going to be at risk in both the scenario where local coastal defenses are funded and maintained, and additionally, if defenses were not present or unfun unfunded and abandoned. Um, which is the no active intervention scenario that I spoke about earlier. Now, the National Coastal Erosion Risk Management includes lengths of coast with consistent characteristics based on the cliff behavior characteristics and the defense characteristics. Even assuming that government spending on coastal defenses is maintained in perpetuity, we still see the likelihood of around 750 properties being lost to the sea in the short term. So that's in the next 20 years. A further 2,000 properties in the medium term, so that's the 20 to 50 years, and an additional 5,700 properties in the long term, so that's 50 plus years. If investment isn't maintained through lack of available funds or political will, then these figures could rise to over 80,000 properties disappearing in the long term. So again, there's a lot of factors, you know, affecting these figures, but we kind of want to give you as, as much information as possible in terms of all of the different scenarios um, and not just the worst case scenario. Uh, now, the NCRM shows potential erosion extent from the coastal baseline for the three time periods I've mentioned, so 0 to 20, 20 to 50, and 50 to 100, and then to three degrees of likelihood. You've got 95%, 50%, and 5%. So therefore, if a property has been identified in a long term, with a 50% confidence level, this equates to there being a 50% chance the property will be impacted by coastal erosion in the long term with no intervention measures in place. Hopefully I haven't confused you too much, but that's how it's broken down. And I hope the visual, as you can see, where it goes from red to orange to yellow really helps, um, helps you understand and see the risk uh, to the coast. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, we, we use all of the up-to-date uh, information from, environment, from the Environment Agency in National Resource Wales. Um, the coastal erosion section 
normally is either in the middle of a report, like a GeoRisk or a GeoRisk Plus, um, and it is actually within the natural instability section. So if you're ever wondering where it is in a report, depending on the, the report that you get, uh, the information is available in a GeoRisk or in a Vista, and it will be in the natural instability section. Now, reductions in value of between 10 and 25% have been reported once the risks of erosion have become known. And the reductions are expected to increase as, as the residual life of a property decreases. And many mortgage lenders require a residual life of 60 years. A property with a residual life of around 60 years may only be available to a reduced number of potential buyers, i.e. those who don't require a mortgage. And this would reduce demand for the property and is likely to result in a reduced price and difficulties actually getting a mortgage. But again, when you look at all of the data in the report, we do provide all this information with all of the breakdown of the meanings in there. And basically, um, in case, as if I haven't already mentioned it, um, you, you can either get this type of information in a standalone report, which is the GeoRisk or GeoRisk Plus, or if you want everything included in one, then you get uh, an Avista. You can get an Avista, which is all of your enviro covered, plus uh, ground stability, things like coastal erosion, natural instability, that's all included. So from a conveyancing handbook perspective, you basically have maximum compliance when it comes to the handbook and everything's already included. So it really depends on what you and your clients want, but if it's something if coastal erosion is something that you are concerned about, then either of those three reports will cover it, depending on your requirements. Um, and that is pretty much it for today. So hopefully you found today helpful um, and interesting. And as I as I said, you know, climate change is is impacting a lot of factors: flood, ground stability, coastal erosion. It's all linked. Um, and there's a lot of science to prove that. And so really at this point in time, it's how do you prepare for it? And how do you make people aware uh, of what the potential risks are? So hopefully you found this uh, helpful. If you've got any questions, please do let us know. I'm more than happy to help. And as I said, we've got a recording of today's session as well as a copy of the slides if you'd like that. So thanks again for joining us. and. We will catch you again at the next webinar and there'll be a quick feedback survey launching straight after this. Have a great rest of the day.